Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here with Nathan Zook. We're in Washington, D.C., just pretty close here to your house. You live here. Um, you're also a pastor in a church up in Baltimore. Um, U.S. capital is right here, right in the heart of, of, American, uh, of the American capital. One question I have for you is how have the Anabaptists provided a unique perspective, especially historically, when it comes to issues of quote, races or different different ethnicities here in America? Probably the, the, one of the earliest and most famous examples would be in 1688. There were three uh, Mennonites who came to the so-called New World. Uh, they were settled near Germantown in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There was no ordained Mennonite minister or bishop mm. here in the colonies, and so they began attending the local Quaker fellowship. They joined up with a pietist uh, individual and they articulated a petition against slavery hmm. to the local meeting. This is not a political petition. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a petition to the local congregation where they were worshiping in Germantown. They articulated the idea that humans are uh, created by God mm. and that it would be uh, slavery was wrong on so many levels, including uh, dividing hmm. the sacred institution of marriage, dividing husbands from wives mm -hmm. as their owners would take them into to different states and so forth. Some of those three Mennonites became Quakers at some point, but they were uh, you know, definitely some of the early people to speak mm -hmm. out in this college. It's one that's the first known written document against slavery in the world. Wow. Also. So it's, it's a key um, well, factor. It's like 90 years, give or take, before the founding of America, before the Declaration of Independence. Right. To my knowledge, there were no Mennonites in good standing of a congregation in this continent that owned slaves. Uh, wow. There was one man who came from Germany as a Mennonite, uh, never joined the church here, uh, was believed to have owned a slave, mm -hmm. um, but did not become affiliated with the local Mennonite church once he moved here. It does seem like um, Mennonites were able to remove themselves from that mm -hmm. institution, which is pretty widespread among m almost all other denominations in the New wow. World. So. so let's go through some American history then. How have Mennonites expressed themselves when it came to issues of slavery, different mm -hmm. um, ethnicities, how they're treated. I'm thinking, you know, before the Civil War, what was, you know, up to that point, and then that Reconstruction period, the, the Civil Rights Movement then later, you know, of the, 20, of the mm -hmm. 20th century. Kind of walk us through that. I mean, there's always going to be exceptions. You know, Mennonite individuals sure. who go astray or drift into the, you know, practices of the society around them. But for the most part, Mennonites uh, were pretty consistent in mm -hmm. definitely not owning slaves, but also in trying to love people on both sides, whether the slave owners, slaveholders, mm -hmm. or the slaves themselves. I was reading recently a, a case of a uh, congregation, a district, a Mennonite district in Virginia, mm -hmm. that where some of the local Mennonites would assist their plantation neighbors of mm -hmm. other denominations with getting in the crops, you know, harvesting mm -hmm. and so forth. And so in return, some of those plantation owners would send their slaves to help out with the Mennonite farms. Mm -hmm. And so Mennonites in this one district determined that they would pay for that labor, even though they, oh, it was wow. being reciprocal, they you know, volunteered for the slave owner mm -hmm. and they would help them, but they were going to pay, but they were going to pay the slaves uh, the money. And so it was an individual way to love their neighbor. Mm. They didn't owe anything to the plantation owner because they'd already worked on their field mm -hmm. themselves, but they were going to pay the slaves as having dignity as human beings. Yeah, you know, there's, there's ways to address these issues without getting politically mm. involved. Mm -hmm. um, Paul talks to the slaveholder, Philemon, and asks him to you know, welcome his escaped slave back into fellowship. Mm -hmm. And so there's ways to in a quiet manner, but yet a loving, strong manner, to love both sides in these mm -hmm. kinds of issues, even mm -hmm. whether it's the abuser, the oppressor, mm -hmm. or whether it's the person being oppressed. So do we <laughs> see that, that kind of mindset carrying further into history, or, you know, further along, yeah, I'm thinking especially the last century where, sure. you know, the civil rights movement and things. W was there any involvement there uh, in the Mennonites? There were definitely Mennonites who were involved in various elements of the civil rights movement. Um, but there are also those who took a very quiet uh, approach as well. And I was reading about, a, um, in also in Mississippi, a group of rural northern Mennonites who went to help set up some camps, mm -hmm. uh, sort of outdoors camps to help youth and so forth. Camp Landon in particular was a place where the staff were trying to invite you know, blacks and whites to be mm. part of their, of their uh, campgrounds mm. and so forth. The voluntary service workers went out one 
uh, day to a local hospital to sing. And they were singing in the different wards. And the, uh, as the story goes, the, they were in the main ward with where the whites were located. And then all of a sudden one of the nurses said, hey, what happened to that group? They just disappeared. Did they leave already? And the other nurse said, no, they went into the black wards to sing. And that was unusual. Ah, yeah. And she said, well, yeah. they're Mennonites. They, they don't take a side on the racial divides. And that's, hmm. a, that's a quiet testament that, you know, we're not protesting, we're not marching, but we're, we're actually here to say mm -hmm. we love them as equal mm -hmm. as the others. Mm -hmm. And they actually went there with the idea they would help uh, assist in um, needy African-American communities. Too. So they were trying to reach yeah. out to both sides in the, uh, in the racial categories. Yeah, a consistent <clears throat> um, living out this. Right. But it's not, you know, holding a sign is one thing, but right. actually living it day to day is a much harder and Right. That's more rare, you yes. know, in a way. So historically and, and currently, uh, Anabaptist people have not gotten politically involved, at, I mean, as a general rule. So then we have cases like, you know, writing petitions and, and things like that would feel maybe foreign to us. W what are some ways that Anabaptists were able to, to stand up mm -hmm. against these things? I think uh, on one hand to exemplify in their churches that they don't have to be segregated. Uh. Um, when some of the early Anabaptist movements began reaching out in, in uh, you know, communities, Native American communities or black communities, uh, they would set up several chur separate churches for that group. Mm -hmm. And then they began, they began saying, hey, you know, we're all equal in Christ. Mm -hmm. We should all be worshiping together. And so taking that stance, uh, you know, decades before Martin Luther King Jr. mentioned that Sunday is the most segregated day of the week, <laughs> uh, yeah. The Mennonites were already moving in the direction of we were going to be worshiping together as fellow brothers and sisters. And they were ordaining African American ministers, they were um, ordaining Native American ministers, and trying to emphasize that um, in the church we're all equal. We can be a refuge from the mm -hmm. racial tensions mm -hmm. around us. And the, the, the real testimony is that we can be people who, who show love even when society is looking down on that. Mm -hmm. And they're not following the trends of society. When society moves in a more progressive direction, that's not when we take our cues. We mm -hmm. take our cues from the scripture. We will be mm -hmm. probably at the forefront of having an integrated congregation. And I think that Mennonites have, Anabaptists in general, have a reputation for helping out in disaster relief and so forth mm -hmm. in areas that yeah. may not be among the most powerful or trying to set their sights on ingratiating themselves with people who are wealthier and powerful, but helping those who mm -hmm. are our neighbors and need our help. It's all about loving your neighbor, right? no matter who that neighbor would, exactly. might be. And, and acknowledging that that neighbor is every bit as equal in God's eyes, every bit as um, loved by God. I mean, and God talks in the, uh, I didn't look up the scripture before I came here, but um, he mentions the Assyrians are mine, the Egyptians are mine, and yeah. these are people I've created too, just like the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so as you move into, you know, our, our day and age, just like whatever ethnicity or race um, mm -hmm. we are part of, uh, God loves the others just like, just like He loves mm -hmm. us. In recent years here in, in America, mm -hmm. and, and currently too, racial tension seems to be very high right yes. now. And that could be um, tempting to try to get involved politically or to vote or to really be vocal about our position, our perspective. How would, what, what would you say to churches or, or individuals that are really wrestling with this? How can they have their voice but still hold true to these Anabaptist values? We need to consider that, um, are we linking ourselves up in partnership with those who are using unloving methods to get their goals accomplished? So scripturally, yeah, rioting is not what mm -hmm. we're called to do. On the other hand, though, we are called in Isaiah to uh, break the yoke of oppression. Mm -hmm. And to, you know, our fast that we have chosen, is it not to, the fast that God has chosen, is it not just to remove ourselves from eating, or is it to help those who are in need hmm. and oppressed? And so emphasize, understanding, trying to sympathize with those who don't see society as privileging mm -hmm. their, their race or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And maybe not, definitely not adopting uh, those radical methods, but also mm -hmm. emphasizing and listening to them and realizing that there is a, a, a real pain here. Mm -hmm. And how can we, as, as I think as the Anabaptists, we can love those who are um, being oppressed, but we can also mm -hmm. love the oppressor. And that's where it gets very touchy. We, we're not to be focused on maybe what people think about us, we're to be focused on what is 
Christ mm -hmm. call us to do? How would Christ really respond? And so he was living mm -hmm. in a very oppressive society where mm -hmm. the Jewish people were being oppressed by the Romans. There was no question. It was one of the most oppressive yeah. periods or empires at that time for the Jewish people. And so he's not calling out the Roman Empire for mm -hmm. being oppressive. Following Christ means we will be loving everybody involved. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not in the way that they want us to, maybe not in the way that they <laughs> feel yeah. we should respond, but still being approachable and loving. Mm -hmm. I think um, Anabaptists have been wise to, when they've tried to refrain from getting too caught up in the scientific categorizations of people. And if we can avoid stereotyping people and avoid um, making assumptions or profiling people because of their perceived physical appearance, I think that's really strong. Mm -hmm. testimony we can have to others. That's really interesting. Um, <coughs> we did an episode with Clayton Shank down in New York okay. and he was talking about different prejudices and things he's mm -hmm. faced in the city and he, that was a big one he mentioned was hospitality it was so mm -hmm. huge in breaking down barriers. Sure, um, yeah. You know just opening it up and just saying you know, you come join us be right. part of us. We, It's not just I'm your friend you, you're a part of my family you know, right. and they would have people over for supper or whatever. It's yeah. really interesting to hear some of those stories and how yeah. powerful that can be. And that's something, you know, I think all of us could do that. Absolutely. You know. You raised a great point. Uh, a number of years ago here in D.C., I was taking a group of um, Bible study, uh, Bible school volunteers around mm -hmm. the city. And we were about to get on the metro. And a group of teenagers were sitting on the grass near the sidewalk there as we were walking. And our group, if you look at us, we all were of European descent. Yeah. And the people, the, the teenagers there, uh, made some comments that were racially tinged comments, uh, prejudicial comments against mm -hmm. us. And so I heard what they said, I knew what they said, and because I knew the local culture, I sort of had my guard up, or mm -hmm. protect my group you know, from hate or prejudice. Mm -hmm. But the people I was with, they didn't know what the teenagers had said, they didn't understand what they had, the comments they had made, and they smiled, they showed love. They smiled and said, hey, how are you doing? And they began talking to them, and a, and a beautiful interaction took place. Really? Those teenagers wow. began responding very positively to that, mm -hmm. whereas if they had been trained or orientated <laughs> about the, uh, the words being used, they might be like me and put up their guard. Last question here, but mm -hmm. what are steps that believers, followers of Jesus, can take in a country like the United States, where there is still a lot of unrest over mm -hmm. you know, different groups of people what, how, can, how can we help bring peace to that situation? I think a big part of it is um, just really attempting to be very careful when we talk that we are not emphasizing and highlighting race and racial characteristics uh, yeah. in, our, in our jokes, in our stories. I mean, there's so many times we'll tell a story about, I saw this person and we, we add to it their mm -hmm. race. Our, our physical characteristics are beautiful things mm -hmm. created for us by God, but we don't have to always make that the central focus of the story. Mm -hmm. Because then it becomes the idea that because of that person's ethnicity, therefore that's why they acted this way. And that's in many cases yeah. not the case. That I did an experiment with my son, my oldest son, as I worked with my other children. But my oldest son, I was, I was very careful in his first seven years of life not to ever mention a person's ethnicity around him. It worked. It was it, it, interesting. We, we really did not talk about people in terms of their ethnicity. One mm -hmm. time we were playing with these little Fisher Price toys. Mm -hmm like wooden bodies and wooden heads and the, the head was one color the body a different color and so he says hey can you pass me the black man so i looked at the characters and the only person with the face that was darker than the rest was next to him so i looked around and i saw a man a little figure next to me uh, with what i would call a white or pale face and a black suit as so i passed that to him he said thank you <laughs> no I said, you, so I looked to the man that had a darker face and said, can you pass me the green man? Because he had a green suit. He said, sure. He passed me that man. Wow. He was judging people by their, by their uh, clothing. That's really fascinating because I focus so much on maybe the physical characteristics. Mm -hmm. When in reality, our clothing changes. And who we are is mm -hmm. more about who we are inside, not about the mm -hmm. physical you know, appearance and so forth. Mm -hmm. A step we can take, I think, is to put ourselves in situations where we are in the minority. And that was a, that's been a big part of my life. I grew up in a neighborhood the first 18 years of my life. And actually, currently, I live in a neighborhood where I'm a racial minority. You know, putting ourselves voluntarily in those kinds of situations, mm -hmm. I think, can be good because so often 
we as Americans expect diversity to happen, but other people adopting our culture and fitting in with us, and we feel comfortable when we are in the majority, and then they can just come visit us. Mm -hmm. But what if we put ourselves in the situation where we are in the minority, and mm -hmm. we go live among people or visit in their homes? So I think it's, it's a way to um, to have a, let people know genuinely that you're, you care about them, mm -hmm. and uh, you have a comfort level that you don't have to always be in the majority. Mm -hmm. One thing, I th uh, getting back to the early, how, how Mennonites or Anabaptists have viewed race, uh, one thing that keeps coming up again and again in the historical mm -hmm. books on segregation and on integration and so forth was that a big reason for all of society, not all of white society, not just Mennonites, mm -hmm. but to oppose integration was because it was a fear of um, intermarriage, racial intermarriage. Oh, mm -hmm. And uh, as I've talked in churches, um, through Bible schools or in sermons on race relations, one thing that comes up again and again is we like the idea of they're all equal, we're all one in Christ, but the intermarriage issue is something that people have a, a little more difficulty with, whether mm -hmm. they're Mennonites or, or not. Mm -hmm. And I think we're moving past that as a church, but there's been some real pain in the past for people who have joined mm -hmm. the church. They, are, they were following Christ, they're following Mennonite guidelines, mm -hmm. and um, people say, you know what, we don't want our children to be in the same youth group or marry you because of the days you're marrying you and so forth. Biblically, there's nothing wrong with intermarriage. Mm -hmm. um, the only time intermarriage is talked about in a bad way was marrying idol worshipers or you know in the Bible. Wow. And in Christ's line, we see a lot of you know intermarriage. You could say with Ruth and mm -hmm. and others that came into that. I've heard people say we're reluctant to have our children um, be raised in a church because who will marry them? Wow. And, uh, and so if that's the impression you're we giving off. Ooh, yeah. Thank you so much sure. for sharing and for, yeah. for taking the, it's kind of a lightning rod of a topic, but I yeah. think you, you broke it down really well and given us a lot to think about. I really sure. appreciate you taking the time.